I would have to say the highlight of my career is a kind of composite thing. Composite in that command has been the thing that I've enjoyed doing most, and it's the thing probably that I do best. Certainly gave me more satisfaction than anything else, the opportunity to work with soldiers, the opportunity to develop soldiers, the opportunity to develop an organization, to utilize our NCO chain of command and develop them, and to make an organization good, right on up to the point where it's the best. And I had that opportunity on numerous occasions, I applied. An AFN special with Major General Charles C. Rogers, outgoing usurer Deputy Chief of Staff for Personnel. In the 1950s, General Rogers served in several artillery units in the U.S. and Europe. In 1968, he commanded an artillery battalion for the 1st Infantry Division in Vietnam. He later spent a great deal of time serving in Usover. In the 1970s, he commanded the 42nd Field Artillery Group, 7th Corps Artillery, and in 1978, General Rogers became Deputy Commander of 5th Corps. In July 1980, he was named Usover's Deputy Chief of Staff for Personnel. Decorations awarded include the Purple Heart, the Bronze Star with three oak leaf clusters, the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Legion of Merit, and the Congressional Medal of Honor. General Rogers talks with AFN Specialist Floyd Vasquez about the command soldiers and many of the policies and problems affecting them. General Rogers, in June of 1951, you joined the Army. Why? Well, the, the war in Korea was going on at that time, and the draft was in effect. I came in because it was necessary. However, I would have come in if it were not necessary, simply because my father, throughout all of my formulative years, spoke with such great pride of his having served his country in World War I. He spent two years in, was a male clerk, didn't even leave the country. But for all of his life, he spoke so very positively and with such great pride in having served his country in the armed services. And he spoke so much about it that when I was in college, I was convinced that I wanted to come in to try some of that. If it's that kind of pride that you can get from serving your country, I wanted that pride. During your military career, you've given a lot of yourself to the military. What has the military meant for you? What have you gotten from it? The Army a part of our country has done so much for me in terms of giving me opportunities to show what I can do, giving me opportunities to grow professionally, personally. And what was left for me was to take the opportunities and move out on them with all of my ability and all of my tenacity and all that God has given me to work with here. The Army gave me the opportunity, and the honor Army has greatly honored me in the types of positions that I've had. I've been greatly privileged to have had numerous opportunities to have commanded our soldiers in peacetime and in war, and I know of no more striking privilege that anyone has than the opportunity of commanding our country's soldiers, and we've got some darn good ones. Sir, as one of the many responsibilities of the Deputy Chief of Staff for Personnel is the Equal Opportunity Program, how have things changed over the years? Is the Equal Opportunity Program working? And how are things different now than when you joined the Army? Discrimination has been a fact of life in the Army as long as I've been in it, and I'm sure in our civilian society, you know, long before I came on the scene. Chances are it's going to exist to some degree for an indefinite period. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, we have made great progress in dealing with the issue of discrimination. It's a profound problem and has been a profound problem for many years, indeed throughout my career. When I came in the Army in 51, uh, the units were segregated. In fact, I came to Germany at that time in a black battalion, it was a 155 Field Artillery Battalion, and we came over here and uh, uh, as an all-black unit, uh, we uh, were located initially in Bavaria, and about six or eight months after I'd been here, we integrated with uh, some of the other all-white units that had come over here, uh, and, and experienced some of the problems that were incident to the 
integration. Uh, there was a widespread belief that the integration was going to result in an overall decrease in the efficiency of the unit. Uh, at least many people said that was the reason why they didn't want to integrate. Uh, and and uh, there were some open issues of discrimination at that time. Uh, because people would say, well, I can't help it. I was brought up that way, or I was brought up to believe this, or I was brought up to believe that. And those type things were uh, accepted as a part of the way life was in the Army. Uh, discrimination was overt. Uh, issues in dealing with minorities differently than dealing with whites were overt. When did this first start change? When did I see it perceptibly? Perhaps in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, after President Truman's proclamation to integrate the services began to take effect, and commanders began to get on board with the idea, whether they liked it or not, uh, and they began to make the idea and the philosophy of equal opportunity a real thing. When they began to treat the minorities about the same way they treated everybody else. When I was a young officer, they'd write on your efficiency report, so-and-so is a very good Negro officer. So you identified right in the beginning for the boards that you were a Negro officer, and Negro officers didn't historically get the same level efficiency reports as others did. I know. I grew up with that. But it's a tribute to our country and a tribute more to our military services, if I can speak for the Army, because we worked diligently, very conscientiously, to attenuate this issue of discrimination to work hard to eliminate it to the highest degree feasible, and heaven knows we haven't eliminated it yet. But we've knocked down so many barriers, particularly the ones that dealt with what has been described as institutional racism. You couldn't get to the top because there were so many things along the way in terms of ladder steps that you couldn't do to get to the top. You couldn't, uh, if you didn't go to the Command General Staff College at Leavenworth, for example, your probability of getting promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and subsequently commanding a battalion, non-existent. If you didn't command as a lieutenant colonel, probabilities of you're getting selected to go to war college, not existent. If you didn't go to the war college and command at the 06 level or full colonel level, the probability you're getting selected for general officer, non existent. So why didn't you have a lot of black senior officers at that time or other minority senior officers? Because the system discriminated institutionally at all those levels. Now, in the late 60s and the early 70s, Heaven knows we didn't make the system perfect, but we started with great conviction to dealing with that system and knocking down those barriers and attenuating the others. And we have done that to a very high level right now, not to the point where it's pet perfect, because of course it isn't. But I did a survey about three years ago when I was Deputy Commanding General of Fifth Corps, sent it out to about 10,000 soldiers with the proper demographics so I could identify the soldiers as by grade, identify them by race, identify them by sex, and uh, asked a couple of loaded questions in the survey. One of them was, do you feel that the, race, that the uh, Equal Opportunity Race Relations Program is working? And the answer that came back, let's take our, his, our uh, minorities first, blacks, very, very high percentage of them say, yeah, it's working real well. And I asked questions, do you have an opportunity to get promoted or selected for higher schooling as quickly and as easily as others in your unit? The answer came back predominantly, yes. Do you think that your NCO really cares about you and your promotion, your career aspirations? Most of the answers said yes. Now these were blacks I'm talking about now. The whites, most of them of course would indicate that the situation was working pretty well as far as they were concerned. The two groups that indicated they were not satisfied that the Equal Opportunity Program was working exceptionally well for them or up to the level that it should were our Hispanic Americans and our females. Zeroing in on that concern, and it was a very legitimate one, the first year I was here as desperate usurer, we developed the usura annual equal opportunity theme around those two issues, dealing with the issues and concerns of our Hispanics, 